Jesus. It's talking about how Sodom, to me, I would kind of consider it as like a, a nice city maybe where people like to go on vacation. Maybe like Orlando, because if people say, if I'm going to go somewhere, maybe not now because you got COVID really bad in Florida. But before that time happened, you ask a kid, where do you want to go? Well, let's go to Disney World. Let's go to Florida. Let's go to a, a nice tourist place. This is where all the merchants went and traveled. They would come here with their things. People would go there to buy and sell. You could walk out in your front yard. You'd have fruit trees right there. You'd have avocado trees, and it'd be nice. Man, I just walk outside. It's lush. It's beautiful. It's green. This is the place people wanted to be. It wasn't thought of as some crime-riddled ghetto city where no one wanted to go. Everyone wanted to go there. Lot made it his home. Lot's wife made it home. Lot's daughters made it home. Lot's sons-in-law made it home. And they lived there for quite a while. Until one day, as we find out in Genesis chapter 19, something happens that changes their life for, forever. It says in Genesis 19, Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Here, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the open square. Now, I'm going to say this. 
I've never lived in a city that I've really enjoyed, but I did live in Atlanta. And I'll tell you this, if I was ever visiting Atlanta and I didn't have a place to stay and a church member invited me, I wouldn't say, no thanks, I'll stay in the open square tonight. <laughs> but these two strangers said, no, we're going to go ahead and just stay here in the open square. But Lot insisted strongly, and so he turned so it turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from the quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men that came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Now I'm going to stop there. Now when you read the passage... Luke 17, where we read, Remember Lot's wife. Jesus describes Sodom, and not once does he describe their carnal passions. He doesn't mention that as a reason to remember Lot's wife. And we're going to get back to that, because a lot of times when we, we study the story of Sodom, like, Sodom's just a bad city just because they're all Sodomites, and they lusted after the flesh, and they were all carnal in nature. That's not why Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. Even though that was a problem in the city, but the city had a lot more problems than just that. Now when you go on to the story, you know that the angels blind those wicked men. After Lot says, well, I'll give them my daughters. And they said, no, you won't. And they blinded the wicked men. And then they tell this to Lot in verse 12. Then the angel said to Lot, this is Genesis 19, 12, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place? For we will destroy this place because the outcry against it has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws whom had married his daughters and said, Get up! Get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-laws he seemed to be joking. I wonder if Lot was actually talking to them in a joking way. I doubt it. I doubt he was trying to be sarcastic. I think he was probably pretty serious and um, maybe zealous, maybe passionate. We've got to get out of here. But even his family did not believe. And it said, When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, I want to stop there at that word. What does linger mean to you? He stayed around. He delayed. He put it off. He waited. While Lot lingered. That's an important text for all of us, but especially, I want to say, for the men here, the priests of the household. Sometimes when we linger when with, with what God asks us to do, it we might eventually get out and save ourselves, but it might cost us some family. It says, While Lot lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out of the city and set him outside the city. God is full of mercy. Because really, all of Lot's family should have perished. None of them wanted to leave Babylon. We'll just call it Babylon. None of them wanted to get out. They didn't want to come out. Even Lot lingered. And to tell you the truth, it would be hard. We might say, well, why didn't he get out? Just listen. Lot had made that his home. He paid off his mortgage. They had decorated the house the way they wanted they had interior decorators come in and they had all their bedrooms done the way they want and their living room was good and the, the kitchen they always wanted. And it was their home. They liked their neighbors. They had the landscaping and the, this was home. And the angel was saying, leave. And what can, what can we take with us? You got a backpack. You got 15 minutes. Whatever you can get in it, get out. Can't take a lot. Can't take a lot because you're leaving on foot. And they sat and lingered. Lot sat and lingered. And it says that the angels were merciful and led Lot, his wife, and daughters out by hand outside the city. Verse 17, So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. So he's saying it's time to get out of the valley. 
And don't even look back. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Now Lot is going to plead with them. Lot says, Please know my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. So Lot is telling the angels that I, I'm admitting you're the ones who, who saved me here. And he says, But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now the city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And the angel said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this little city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. It'd be like you living in Chattanooga and say, Lord, man, you're making me leave the city. At least let me go into Saudi Daisy. <laughs> Don't send me further out than that. All right, maybe Dunlap, but not further out than that. Don't send me up into the, the wilderness of Spencer. <laughs> You can just go further and further out. But Lot's saying, please, let me go in this. And, and there's nothing wrong with being there. I'm, I'm a country boy. I'm a wilderness boy. So I'm not here knocking those who live way out. But this is what Lot's saying. The angel said, okay, you can stay in this little city. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. So it was just daylight in verse 24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Jesus said, remember... Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back. You know, in this book, I have encouraged you, if you have it, to read. There's a little statement right in the middle uh, of the chapter called The Destruction of Sodom. And it talks about Lot's delay. I took that verse, Lot lingered. And it's written here, if Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning. But if he had earnestly fled towards the mountains without one word of pleading, his wife also would have made her escape. I thought, wow, did Lot have a part to play? Men, remember Lot's wife. You might have a part to play in the destruction of your own family if you don't obey God. Remember Lot's wife because you don't want to lose yours. Remember Lot's wife and kids because you don't want to lose yours. We don't want to lose our families. And when God asks us as a priest of the household, I need you to do something, get your family and take them and do it. It says the influence of Lot's example would have saved her from the sin that sealed her doom. But his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. While her body was upon the plain, her heart clung to Sodom. And she perished with it. Luke 17. Luke 17 and verse 28. Jesus says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. He doesn't mention anything about sodomy there. He just says they live like we, life like we do here in America. That's it. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. This commentary that I was reading earlier called Patriots and Prophets said they had everything they needed so they could live lives of entertainment. It's like, you know what? We have all of our heart's desire. Let's entertain ourselves. Isn't that, that the American dream? Jesus says they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out, of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. See, this story is going to play itself out again. That's why it's so important, especially for our generation. We're going to live this. And God is calling us out. One day it'll be physically, we should already be out spiritually. Those who don't come out spiritually, I'm going to say, those who don't come out spiritually of Babylon, you're not coming out physically. So we need to pray to God that our hearts are right and our hearts aren't in love and attached to the world. Because if that's where our hearts are, that's where our treasure is. 
it says, In that day he was on the housetop, and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. For some of us, you might not get a backpack to take out with you. Imagine that. My daughter would all say, You know what, Dad? When the time comes, you know, where we're no longer attached to the world, and we're getting ready and making our journey on, we know Jesus is about to come. What can I take with me? What, what favorite toy can I take? And I said, you might be, you, don't, don't be worrying about a favorite toy at that time. Our, our eyes will be on Jesus. It says here in this verse, if you're on the housetop and you know it's time to leave, get off the roof and go. If you're out in the field, do not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. She just looked back. You know, Jesus could have used other examples in Scripture. There are a lot of people in Scripture that look back. In fact, Israel, who was going to the promised land, had a big problem with looking back. I want to look at three reasons today why people look back. Why is it that people look back a lot? I'm going to be honest, there are times in life where I look back. But I've got to get to the place where I don't. Where my eyes are fixed ahead and just constantly on Jesus. Looking back can be very dangerous. Looking back can be deadly. Exodus chapter 14, if you have your Bibles. We're going to look at just a portion of Scripture today where it talks about Israel leaving Egypt for the promised land. We're leaving this world for the promised land. And as I said earlier in the children's story, there is nothing I can take with me to heaven. I can't take three items in a book bag, and I can't take the book bag itself. I can take my character and hopefully I can take friends and family. Exodus chapter 14. Says when Pharaoh, actually I'm 14 verse 10. Exodus 14 10 said when Pharaoh drew near the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we should serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which what He will accomplish for you today. It's amazing what fear makes us do. I have so many folks I run into is like, man, I wish it was 2019 again. Even in the church, why are you looking back to 2019? That takes us a year away from Jesus coming. We want to move closer towards it. But 2019 was better. I'm going to tell you this, it's not going to get any better. When you get to 2021, you're going to be begging for 2020 possibly. But don't look back. Don't look back to the days and say, man, I wish we could go back to the days before COVID and before the days before masks. It's amazing what people do when fear hits. These guys here were saying, oh man, if we could just live, with, live under the constraints of Pharaoh and his harshness again. Really? You want to go back to that? Pharaoh wasn't a nice guy. He was beating you guys and, and he was making your life miserable. But you want to go back to that because you're afraid? Yeah, we do. And Moses says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't look back and say, man, the old days were so much better because you're afraid of the unknown of the future. Why? Because we have a God who goes before us. And he says, stand still and see my deliverance. Doesn't the Bible say perfect love cast out all fear? Jesus told his disciples, why are you afraid when I am with you? I'm sure they're thinking, man, if only we didn't get on this boat, we wouldn't be in the storm right now. Why are you looking back? Jesus is with you in the storm. He's going to take you through to the other side. We won't get to the other side unless we go through the storm. There's a time of trouble ahead the whole earth's going to face. We don't, get, we don't get to the promised land unless we go through it. So no need to look back. But I plead with you now, don't look back and say, man, if only we could be in the days before Corona. If only we could go to our favorite restaurants. Some of you still can today. It's just not quite as easy or as nice to go as it used to be. But I know during the months where you were locked in and locked down, a lot of people are thinking, man, if only we could go back to 2019. Don't look back. Fear. 
It's a big reason. It's a big problem that causes people to look back. But there's even bigger issues that we face sometimes that make us look back. Exodus 16, the next chapter. Actually, it's two chapters ahead. Exodus 16 and verse 3. It says, And the children of Israel said to Moses and Aaron, said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Again, they're looking back. God's taken them out of Egypt, and they're looking back. We just should have stayed there and died. When we sat by the pots of meat, and we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Is that why God took them out there? I'm going to take it from Egypt just to kill you all for a hunger's sake. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold... I will rain bread down from heaven. I will rain bread down from heaven. If I was taking my backpack, I thought really hard, if I could take three things, I certainly want to have something for water. I certainly want to have something to get food. And I want something to have fire. I thought that, that had to be the three things. So that's all I could have for my family. And I just started thinking, well, that's interesting. All the things that I was thinking about bringing... Does God not meet our needs? Because I'm just thinking of the needs that I'll need during the time of trouble. And God says, if you were just spiritually connected to me, you wouldn't worry about your needs. Doesn't my word tell you that I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Oh, you rob of little faith. You're not ready for the times ahead because you're not spiritually prepared. Forget about being physically prepared. There's no way you could pack enough stuff. But I'm the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I can feed you with bread from heaven. I can feed you from the, the raven's mouths if so needed. Do you trust me on this? You can go without a backpack. If you're on the roof, you can go. You don't need to run back in and say, wait a minute, at least I need to get my fire starter. <laughs> you don't need it. Because think about the children of Israel. Wasn't I the fire by night? But God, I need my needs met. I, I understand you might not supply my wants, but I've got to look after my needs this week, my air conditioning went out again. <laughs> I had it fixed just a month ago. I say this week. It was yesterday. <laughs> yesterday it went out, and I called my AC guy, and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm on vacation. <laughs> I said, well, my family's coming in town. I really, it would be nice to get this fixed. He's like, well, I'll call a buddy of mine who's helping me. Maybe I can, I can get him to go. So I was kind of in a bad mood yesterday. It's not good when I'm in a bad mood, because I promote that bad mood to my, my wife and uh, kids. My wife's sister's in town, and sometimes that puts me in a bad mood when I have all the family in town. So, anyways, I wasn't in a great mood. I wasn't in a great mood. And now my AC is broke and said, God, why this? Why this? Why can't I go back to last year or a few years? Why can't my house just be a, like it was a few years ago and the AC just working great? This is twice in a month. So my wife left me there in the house in the heat in a bad mood and she went to be with her sister and family at their house which had good AC. And something kind of inspired my mind to think, well, when's the last time you changed the air filter? So it's probably been a few months. Yeah, probably. So I went, it was filthy. I took it out and put a new one in. Within two hours, it went from 80 down to 72. I said, God, I did not deserve that. I did not deserve that. I'm going to say this. Air conditioning is not a need. It's nice to have. It's pleasant to have. But I know it's not a need because when I was a missionary in Ponape, no one had it except for the Americans. <laughs> except for the missionaries who were there to give of their selves and actually try to rough it. We were the only ones who had AC. All the locals didn't have AC. And they were living in 90 degree temperature and it was fine. So I learned that maybe AC is not a need after all. It's nice. <laughs> it is nice to have. So God was kind to me and he took care of even my wants yesterday and he cooled the house down and I thought, God, you're too good for me. You're too good to me and he kind of spoke to my mind, if, if I take care of your wants, you don't think I would take care of your needs? Don't, doesn't my word tell you that your bread and water will be assured and you're trying to stock up on water purification systems for the last days? We're not to be preppers necessarily except for spiritually prepared so we can trust God to take care of whatever need I have. Was God not the cloud to shade and give the Israelites air conditioning by day and the fire to give them warmth and light by night? Can God not supply all of my needs? Yes, God can. And who's supplying my needs right now? God. Sometimes we forget that because we think, well, we're the ones working. Well, who gives me the ability to work? Who gave me the job that I have? God did. 
God even now is playing my needs. And he said, even if I've got to do everything, I'll do that for you. I'll supply all of your needs. Can I trust God to do that? Can you trust God to do that? There's something even greater that keeps us from looking forward. Unfortunately, the book of Numbers kind of concludes the story of Israel looking back. It's amazing. These guys look back a lot. You can go through the journey. They look back. God helps them. They look back. We've got to keep looking forward at God's blessings. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 4 says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense cravings. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. The bread wasn't enough. The water from the rock was not enough. We want meat. We're tired of the bread. We want Taco Bell, as my kids would say when we were in Romania on a mission trip. We're tired of working in this orphanage, eating their turnips and their soup and their bread. We want to go back to Taco Bell. I was like, you didn't even like Taco Bell. Well, we like it now. We want to get back. There's going to be those in the end who said, you know what, God? Your bread's not enough. Your water is not enough. We want our wants to be met, too. And they look back. And now God here gave them their wants. And they were plagued by the meat that they ate. And many of them died. I'll tell you what, the meats that we eat today are full of pollutants and plagues too. And many people lose their health and eat some even their lives from the great American diet. God's diet is perfect. Don't look back. Don't look back. The Bible doesn't say God will supply all my wants. And it's good that God doesn't give me everything I want. Because the things that I want most often aren't so good for me. The things that God desires for me are always for my best. They're always going to give me happiness and health and life. God was providing everything Israel needed for their health, for their happiness, and for their well-being in life. But they said, no, we want to go back to when we were in Egypt. We want to have meat. Are we looking back because there are things that we want? Oh man, we want to have our TVs. We want to have our internet. We want to have our cell phones. We want to have the places where we like to eat out. These are wants. These are cravings of the carnal heart that cause us to look back. Lot's wife craved Sodom. She craved the things of the city. She didn't want to give them up. What does your heart crave? If our heart craves worldliness right now, it's going to be really hard. Even though God's providing for our needs, even though He's providing for protections, it's going to be hard not to look back saying, man, my carnal nature craves that. Yes, the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And we need to be preparing now. You want to be a prepper? Start preparing your hearts for the times ahead. Start preparing your hearts for the times ahead so that you can trust God how much? Completely. Completely, So you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I am satisfied with Jesus and Jesus alone, and he will give me the desires of my heart. He will maketh me lie down by the cool waters. He will lead me in the green pastures. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil. A thousand will fall up my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. God will anoint my head with the Holy Spirit, the oil. And goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And one day I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If we're going to be good preppers, we'll be hiding God's word in our hearts. Because as I thought, everything that I want to prepare for my book bag, God promises me in his word. It's like, wow, the little knife I want to take? God says, my word is a sword. <laughs> It's the sword of the Spirit, and it cuts through the heart. Everything I wanted to take, I can find it right here spiritually in His Word. And God said, I will take care of you. Jesus was in the wilderness, wasn't He, for 40 days? What backpack did He take, Rob? 
I don't think he took one. And God took care of him and sustained him. Will God not sustain us like he did the children of Israel for 40 years? And I even thought about even their shoes didn't wear out. Because I thought, well, at least I have to have some extra shoes. And I said, the children of Israel didn't even have extra shoes. Get your spiritual life right and everything else will, will be okay. Learn how to trust me completely. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to close with this text before we sing a final verse of a song I, I learned as a young person. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You can look back through scriptures and find witnesses that trusted God completely. You can find those like Lot's wife who didn't trust God completely. And there were men who didn't trust God completely as well. He says, look back though on the witnesses, the true witnesses, this great kind of witnesses. You read it in Hebrews chapter 11. Beautiful witnesses that trusted God completely, who left their homes and left everything to go out to who knows where. Because they were looking to another home whose builder and maker was God. This world's not our home. We're just a passing through. Our treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels are beckoning, beckoning us to heaven's open door. And we can't feel at home in this world anymore. We're not going back. The world's not turning back, so there's no reason for you to look back. We're not going to go back to pre-COVID days. Things are only going to get closer to Jesus' return now. The last movements will be rapid ones. Keep your head looking forward. And that's how this verse closes. Look back on the great cloud of witnesses. Throw off everything that hinders. If there are things that are making you look back, get them out of your life. And it says, in the sin that so easily entangles. If you have a cherished sin, if you have a habit, say, God, it's time for me to give up this habit now. There's no more playing games. We know that your coming's around the corner and I've got to give it to you completely. I can't be holding on to your hand and be holding on to the sin over here and be torn apart because eventually God will just say, okay, if you don't want to hold on to my hand, I won't make you. Let go of the sin that so easily entangles. And then it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And I'll say this, if my eyes are fixed on Jesus, they can't be looking back, can they? If my eyes are fixed on Jesus, I'm going to go where Jesus takes me. And it says there'll be a group that follows the Lamb wherever He goes. Why? Because their eyes are fixed on Jesus. And as we do that, the Jesus who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to complete that work. Because you're allowing Him to. Because you're trusting Him completely with every last fiber of your being. My friends, once we put our hands to the plow, don't look back. We're going to sing a couple verses of a song that I learned as a kid. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's not in your hymnal, but I hope you know it by heart. If you're not, you'll learn it today. It's uh, just, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Even during this time of earth's history, as things go chaotic, God still has a work to do. God still has a work to do for His church. And it can only be done for those who say, you know what? There's no time for looking backwards. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And a lot of rain will fall upon you and upon me. And we'll finish this great work that God started. And we won't look back anymore. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.